So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, very, very proud to present to you on behalf of uh, Dixit, Mr. Ben Bramfield, who uh, is an independent software developer and consultant specializing in crowdsourced transcription and digital editions. In 2005, he began developing one of the first web-based manuscript transcription systems released as the open source tool from the page. It has since been used by lab libraries, museums and educators to transcribe archaeology correspondence, military diaries, herpetology field notes, and punk rock fanzines. Ben has been writing and speaking about crowdsource transcription technologies since 2007, and he will go on with that uh, tonight. It's my very, very pleasure to present to you, on behalf of Dixit, Mr. Ben Brumfield! Thank you to Dixit for bringing me here, and uh, thank you all for coming. All right, my, my talk tonight is about accidental editors and the crowd. What is an accidental editor? Most of you people in this room are here because you're editors and you work with editions. So I ask you, look back. Think back to when you decided to become an editor. Maybe you were a small child, and you, you told your mother, when I grow up, I want to be an editor. Or maybe it was just when you applied for a fellowship at Dixit because it sounded like a good deal. The fact of the matter is, there are many editions that are happening by people who never decided to become an editor. They never made any intentional decision to do this, and I'd like to talk about those tonight. So, all this week we've been talking about digital scholarly editions. Tonight, however, I'd like to take you on a tour of digital editions that have no connection whatsoever to the scholarly community in this room. Well, in order to do that, we're going to have to... Is that okay? All right. All right. Um, all right. So, Thorsten Schaassen yesterday defined digital edition saying that a digital edition is anything that calls itself a digital edition. None of the projects that I'm going to talk about tonight call themselves digital editions. <laughs> Many of them have never heard of digital editions. So, we're going to need another definition. We're going to need a functional definition along the lines of Patrick Zalas. And this is the definition I'd like to use tonight. So these are encoded representations of primary sources that are designed to serve a digital resource need. All right, so the need is important. The need gives birth to these digital editions. So what is a need in the world of people who are doing editing without know they're, knowing they're doing editing? Well, I'll start with Ono Robot. <laughs> Everyone is familiar with the digital editing platform Ono Robot, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's say that you read a webcomic. Here's my favorite webcomic, Inkwood. And it has some lovely dark humor about books being huge money losers and everyone gets burned on those deals. And now you have a problem, which is that two years later, a friend of yours says, I'm going to write a book and it's going to be great. And you say, oh, I remember this great comic. I read about that. How am I going to find that, though? Well, fortunately, you can go to the Akewood search service. <laughs> And you type in, huge money loser. And you see a bit of transcript and you click on it. And you have that comic again. You've suddenly found the comic strip from 2002 that referred to books as huge money losers. Now, how is that possible? See this button down here? This button here that says improve transcription. If you click on that button, you'll get a place to edit the text. And you'll get a set of instructions and you'll get a format, a very specific format, an encoding style for editing this webcomic. All right? Where did that format, where did that encoding come from? Well, it came from the world of stage, the world of screenplays. So this reads like a script. All right? And, and the thing is, it actually does work. It works pretty well. Um, so that community has developed this encoding standard to solve this problem. Let's say that you're a genealogist and you want to track 
records of burials from 1684 that are written in horrible old secretary hand and you want to share them with people. No one's going to sit down and read that. They're going to interact with this through something like FreeReg. This is a search engine that I developed for Free UK Genealogy, which is an open data based um, genealogy uh, nonprofit in the UK. And this is how they're going to interact with this data. But how is it actually encoded? How are these volunteers entering what is now, I'm pleased to say, 38 million records? Well, they have rules. They have very strict rules. They have rules that are so strict that they are written in bold. You transcribe what you read, errors and all. <laughs> and if you need help, here is a very simple set of encoding standards that are derived from regular expressions from the world of computer programming. <clears throat> all right? Um, this is a very effective thing to do. One thing I'd like to point out is that in the current database, records encoded using this encoding style are never actually returned. This is embedded because volunteers demand the ability to represent what they see in encoding that's sufficient to do that, even if the results might even be lost, in the hope that someday in the future they will be able to retrieve them. Okay. So far I've been talking mainly about amateur editions. Um, I'd like to talk about another set of accidental editors, which are people in the natural sciences. Um, for years and years, naturalists have studied collections, and they've studied specimens in museums, and they've gotten very, very good at digitizing things like this. This is a wet collection. It's a spider in a jar, and it's a picture I took at the Peabody Museum. Um, in case you've ever wondered whether provenance can be a matter of horror, um, <laughs> let me tell you that the note on this says, found on bananas from Ecuador. <laughs> be careful opening your bananas from Ecuador. Right. But thanks to climate change and thanks to habitat loss, these scientists are returning to these original field books to try to find out about the locations that these were collected from, to find out what the habitats looked like a hundred years ago or more. And for that, these records need to be transcribed. So here is the Smithsonian Institute Transcription Center. Um, this is going to look similar to a lot of people in the room. The encoding is something really interesting because we have this set of square notes, vertical notation in left margin, vertical in red, slash, left margin, vertical in red, all around Meeker. The interesting thing about this encoding is that this was not developed by the Smithsonian. Where did they get this encoding from? They got this encoding from a blog post by one of their volunteers. This is a blog post by Siobhan Leachman, who spends a lot of time volunteering, transcribing for the Smithsonian. And because of her encounter with the text, she was forced to develop a set of transcription encoding standards and to tell all of her friends about it, to try to proselytize, to convert all of the other volunteers to use these conventions. The conventions are pretty complete. They talk about circle text. They talk about superscript text. They talk about geographical names. Um, I'm fairly convinced, and having met Siobhan, I believe she could do it, that given another couple of years, she will have reinvented the TER. <laughs> <laughs> but you may ask me, why are we squished into the back of the room to make room for the swords? And we haven't talked about swords yet. So I'd like to talk about people doing what's called historical European martial arts. This is sword fighting, all right? That is HEMA for short. So you have a group of people doing um, martial arts in the athletic tradition, as well as in the tradition of reenactors, who are trying to recreate um, the martial arts techniques of the past. So there are HEMA chapters all over. Uh, this is a map of central Texas showing the groups near me within about 100 kilometers. And as you can see, many clubs specialize in different traditions. 
Um, there are two clubs near me that specialize in German longsword. There's one club that specializes in the Italian tradition, and there are uh, there's at least one club I know of that specializes in a certain set of weapons from all over Europe. So how do they use them, right? How do they actually recreate the sword fighting techniques? They use the texts in training. And this is a scene from an excellent documentary called uh, Back to the Source, which I think is very telling, um, talking about how they actually interact with these. So here we have somebody explaining a technique, explaining how to pull a sword from someone's hand, and now they're demonstrating it. So where do they get these sources from? Um, for a long time, we, they worked with 19th century print editions. For a long time, people, including the group in this room, worked with photocopies or PDFs on forums. Um, really, all this stuff was very sort of separated and disparate until about five years ago. So five or six years, years ago, Michael Chidester, who was a HEMA practitioner uh, who was bedridden due to a leg injury, had a lot of time on the computer to modify Wikisource, which is the best um, media wiki platform for creating digital editions, to create a site called Wiktenauer. What can you find on Wiktenauer? Okay, here's a very simple example of a fighting manual. Um, we've got the image on one side, we've got a facsimile with illustrations, we have a transcription, and then we have a, trans we have a translation in the middle. This is the most basic. This is something that people can very easily print out, use in the field, in their training. Still, it's a parallel text edition. Um, if you click through any of those, you get to the editing interface, which has a direct connection between the facsimile and the transcript. Right? And the transcript is done using pretty traditional media wiki markup. Okay, now, and I apologize to the people in the back of the room, because this is a complex document. We get into more complex texts, so this is a text by someone named uh, Rengek, and here we have four variants of the same text. So they're producing a variorum edition. Um, in addition to producing the variants, they have a nice introduction explaining the history of Rengek himself and contextualizing the text. What's more, they trace the text itself and they do stematology to explain how these texts developed, all independent. And in fact, even come up with these nice stomatographs. So how are they used? So people study the text, they encounter a new text, and then they practice, okay. And as my friends last night explained to me, the practice informs their reading of the text, right? They are informed deeply by die Köpeligkeit, the actual physicalness of trying out moves, right? And the reason that they're doing this is because they're trying to get back to the original text. And the original text is not what was written down by a scribe the first time. The original text, this Ur text, was what was actually practiced 700 years ago and taught in schools, much like Claire Clavas mentioned talking about Clement of Alexandria. You have this living tradition, parts of it are written down. Those parts are elaborated by members of that living tradition, and now they're reconstructed. What if your interpretation is wrong? Well, one way they find out is by fighting each other. You go to a tournament, you try out your interpretation of those moves. Someone else tries out their interpretation of those moves. If one of you would end up dead, that person's interpretation is wrong. People think that the stakes of scholarly editing are high. What are the challenges to projects like Wiktenauer? So one of the projects, so when I interviewed Michael Scheidester, um, he explained that they, particularly editors in the US, actually do struggle, and they would love to have help from members of the scholarly community dealing with paleography, dealing with linguistic issues, and some of these fundamental issues. 
One of the other big challenges that I found is, by contrast with some of the other projects that we talked about, in many cases, um, the texts on Victor Now are, are of highly varied quality. They try to adjust for this by giving each text a grade, but if an individual is going to contribute a text, um, and they're the only one willing to do it, they sort of have to take what they get. Um, my theory for why Victor Noir transcripts may be of different quality from those that you see on the Smithsonian um, or that the genealogists produce is that for those people, the transcription, the act of working with the text is an end in itself. Whereas for the Hema community, the texts are a way to get to the fun part, to get to the fighting. 